In the name of the living God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. On the night our Lord Jesus Christ was betrayed, the night before his death on the cross, Jesus said these words, I have yet many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. Seems like a very appropriate verse for Trinity Sunday. So last week, over a billion Christians around the world celebrated Pentecost, the giving of the Holy Spirit and the birthday of the church. 2,000 years ago, on the day of Pentecost, the disciples were all in one place, and the Holy Spirit came with a mighty rushing wind, with tongues of fire. The disciples spoke in different tongues, proclaiming the mighty acts of God. On that day of Pentecost, the church was given the full revelation of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so today... Over a billion Christians around the world are celebrating Trinity Sunday as we rejoice in the mystery of the one God in three persons. Apparently here at St. Vincent's, it's tradition for the curate or the assistant to preach on Trinity Sunday. And you know what? That's a tradition I want to keep going But it's also the second Sunday of the month, and we've been exploring a children's message on the second Sunday, so we have the added bonus of preaching about the Trinity to children. Any volunteers for that? Well, at this time, any children are welcome to come closer to the sanctuary, and parents, if they're feeling shy, you can come with them as well. Good morning, Wyatt. Big brother, huh? That's exciting. Good morning, good morning. Morning, everyone. How we doing? Good. Is it summer? Yeah. Happy summer. No more school, right? Yeah, no. Anybody miss school yet? No. No? School is boring. It's a lot of work. School is boring. It's a lot of work. Well, can I tell you what? I bet your parents really miss you being in school. No? Yeah. Well, any uh, plans this summer? Anybody going on any trips, any vacation time? Where are you going? You're going to Galveston? Cool. We're going to go to Galveston. Yeah, that's Beach Week. We're going to call uh, Galveston. Where are you going? You're going to Camp Cruises. Anybody else going to Camp Cruises? I'm going. Yeah? You're going too, Wyatt? Pickle land. Apparently, pickle land where everyone is made out of pickles. How, how are you going to get there? Uh, you go on an airplane, and then the airplane crashes into a giant pickle. The, the <laughs> airplane turns into a giant, giant pickle? No, the where do you get this? The airplane crashes into a giant pickle. It crashes into a giant pickle. It's, okay, let's move on. So, I know you're not in school, but I want to teach you a few things real fast, okay? I'm going to teach you. Uh, a little bit of an exercise and a little bit of a prayer, okay? So first the exercise, and you can close your eyes if this helps, okay? I want you to picture God. When you think of God, what do you see? Are we going to have pizza after this? Hold on. When you picture God, what do you see? Anybody want to share anything? What do you picture? Not sure. What, what do you picture? I picture just something of this whole like You picture a crown. That's very cool. What do you picture when you picture God? Kind of forgot. That's okay. Can I give you a, a classic image for the, for the picture of God? It's actually this. Hold on a second. It's a triangle. And you have it in the front of your bulletins. And you see in this, the middle it says God. Okay? Now, as God, back up a little bit, please. We have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Spirit is God. But the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Spirit, and the Spirit is not the Father. Is that confusing? Yes. Yeah, it's pretty confusing, isn't it? Yeah. 
It's a little confusing because our minds can't fully wrap around it and, and our, our language can't really describe God fully. So we have this to kind of help us. So I want to teach you a little uh, prayer exercise that I use every day. It helps me connect with God. And it's something I do with my hand and it's something I do with my voice. Okay, so with, with your hand, take your right hand, okay? And I want you to go up, down, shoulder, shoulder. That's the image, that's the sign of the cross. That's to remind us of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So in the morning, here's what I, what I do. So when I wake up and I say, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and then I say this prayer, I call this the PGA prayer. Any golfers out there? The PGA prayer is this. I praise my God this day. I give myself to God this day. I ask God to help me this day. I want pickles on my pizza. And pickles on your pizza. But first, let's practice this, okay? So re- repeat after me. I praise my God this day. I praise my God this day. I give myself to God this day. I give myself to God this day. I ask God to help me this day. Very good. One more time. I praise my God this day. I praise my God this day. I give myself to God this day. I give myself to God this day. I ask God to help me this day. Very good. You can do that every day right in the morning, okay? And we begin that with in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I still want those pickles and fruit loops on my pizza. I'll give you pickles later, okay? Thank you all for coming out today. (laughs) Well, when... uh... When Father Mark offered to do the children's sermon, he presented it like he was doing me a favor, but having listened to it, now I get to try and finish that, follow follow up on that. And I don't know how big of a favor that really is. So this week, before we get any further, um, Bishop Hans, the Bishop of Lipia in Latvia, stopped by the cathedral this week. He showed up right in the middle of me writing this sermon. And uh, uh, so spent some time with him, and he asked me to send his greetings and to let you know that since he interrupted me, if the sermon is terrible, it's his fault. <laughs> I want you to all think back to your childhood. I know for some of you that's a further reach back than others, but go back to about eight years old. At eight years old, what did 10 years mean? Could you even fathom it? Could you wrap your brain around it? I mean, really, how could you, given that you'd never experienced it? You're only eight years old. And if you move forward a couple of years, let's say we go to 18, then what does 10 years look like? You, you've almost lived 10 years twice, in that you're almost 20, it'd be your second, second decade. So now you know what 10 years is like, But it still seems like a long time, right? I mean, only 10 years ago, you were eight years old. So while you could wrap your brain around it, it was this incredible span of time. Continuing on, we go to 30. How did 10 years feel at 30? Now you've done it three times. You got three decades under your belt. 10 years doesn't seem so long anymore. I think for most people, when they hit 30, it feels like only yesterday when they were 20. Now, if we double that again and we go to 60, how does 10 years feel at 60? Well, I don't, I don't personally know. Again, how could I? I haven't experienced it, but I have it on good authority that it goes like a flash. So how do you explain this. At 60, how do you explain 10 years to an 8-year-old? How do you explain something 
that is so much beyond, so much bigger, so much grander than anything they've ever known, anything they've ever seen or experienced. It's incomprehensible. You ever just, you ever go out to the ocean and, and just stare at the water and it goes as far as you can see? Or even better yet, you go out on the ocean and you get to the point where you lose sight of land and there's just this intimidating, awe-inspiring feeling that you were in the middle of nowhere. So beyond any kind of landmark, the ocean is so massive, you can't even wrap your brain around where you are. And then you stop and you think that the Bible says that, that God holds the oceans in the palm of his hand. How can we even begin to comprehend such a being? As Father Mark said, today's Trinity Sunday, and this is the day that we commemorate the doctrine of God as three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but still one God. And it, it doesn't really make much sense. How do we understand it? How do you, I, you know, I think it was admirable to see him, try, how do you explain it to a child? Many churches today will recite the Athanasian Creed. It's in our prayer book. Uh, thankfully, we aren't going to because it's awkward and it's hard to recite as a, as a congregation. But it's popular today because more than half of it is about the doctrine of the Trinity. And I, I, I put it all in my notes and it's like one, two, three pages long. You want me to read the whole thing? I'll give you a little taste. That we worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity, neither confounding the persons nor dividing the essence. For there is one person of the Father, another of the Son, and another of the Holy Ghost. But the Godhead of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost is one. The glory is equal, the majesty co-eternal. Can you imagine saying this in unity, unison? Such as the Father is, such is the Son. Such is the Holy Ghost. The Father uncreated, the Son uncreated, the Holy Ghost uncreated. The Father unlimited, the Son unlimited, the Holy Ghost unlimited. And it just goes on this way. As there are not three uncreated, nor three infinities, uh, there are nor three infinities, but also one uncreated, one infinite. Likewise, the Father is almighty, the Son is almighty, the Holy Ghost is almighty. Yet there are not three almighties, but one almighty. And we could keep going on and on. It, it will skip towards the end. But the whole three persons are co-eternal and co-equal, so that in all things, as aforesaid, the unity in Trinity and Trinity in unity is to be worshipped. He, therefore, that will be saved, let him thus think on the Trinity. Anyone exhausted yet? Confused? And I skipped like three pages. On the cover is that diagram that Father Mark talked about, and that is a, a, an, an artistic rendition of, this, of what this creed is trying to get at. It's so hard to wrap our brains around. We spend hours and hours discussing it in seminary and sitting in, lectionary, in, in lectures about it because it's such an abstract concept. There's something fundamentally unknowable, something fundamentally incomprehensible about God. He's so different from us, so, so foreign to us. And so we come up with these words to describe him. And it's not that they're not true. The words speak of a mystery. And it's a mystery because while we understand what the words mean, we have no context to understand the, the reality that they signify. To say that God is one being, but three persons, to say that he's almighty or omnipotent, to say that he's omniscient, that is all-knowing, to say that he's sovereign, which means to say that he's in control of everything, to say that he's immutable, immutable which means unchanging. We use these words and any good theologian can rattle them off one right after the other without thinking twice about it. But when you dig deeper, what does it mean? Why do we say these things about God? Again, we say them because they reflect deeper truths, deeper realities. And part of the, the human spirit is this desire to understand the reality we've been placed in. It's built into what it means to be human, to be made in the image of God. We have this drive to understand the world around us. 
We create satellites and launch them out of our solar system and we send probes and rovers to planets in our solar system around us and we, we send ships down to the bottom of the deepest ocean and men and women climb the highest mountains trying to understand the reality that we've been placed in. And the same is true when it comes to the divine. And it's a good and holy pursuit to try to understand God. He formed us for relationship with him. St. Augustine has that famous quote, our hearts are restless until they rest in you. And one of the great beauties of the Trinity is that it signals to us that our God is relational because all three persons have a relation with each other. The Athanasian Creed talks about this relationship and it's also though in a primitive form in the Nicene Creed that we'll read in a few minutes. And understanding the full ramifications of what those words mean, of how this works in reality, is probably beyond us. Certainly, it's beyond me and what, what my mind can comprehend. But it signals to me that the Father has a relationship with the Son, has a relationship with the Holy Spirit, and they commune with one another, and they created me to commune with them. And if I'm going to have a relationship with someone, I want to know that person. Have you ever had somebody in your life who acted like they knew you, but the way that they spoke to you or about you revealed that they constantly missed the mark and didn't really know who you were? Like, the big one would be using the wrong name. Right? This is every priest nightmare. And it's happened to me. One Sunday, I'm right down here. Parishioner, I know very well. See every week, comes forward, asks for prayer. I launch into the prayer. Name came off my lips, was not her name. As soon as the name came off my lips, I knew it wasn't her name. Damage was done. It's embarrassing. When I pray for her, I want to communicate to her that I know her, that God knows her, and using the wrong name does not inspire confidence. There's another parishioner and I haven't gotten her permission to share this story, so she'll remain anonymous. But when I first met her, she told me that she didn't expect me to remember her name. And so that every time she said hi to me, she would reintroduce herself until I said hi to her and used her name. So me being the cheeky person that I am, every time I saw her, I would intentionally pick a random name. Hi, Brittany, how are you? Hi, Catherine. Hi, Susie. It was a joke, and she laughed, and it went along fine until I did it in front of another parishioner who then got really confused because they knew that wasn't her name. It was a joke. I really knew her name, but could you imagine if I was sincere? And maybe you don't have to imagine this. Maybe this has happened to you, having someone in your life who calls you by the wrong name. It's distressing, it's, it's frustrating. No one likes to be called by the wrong name. This is a, a simple illustration, but my point is that we have days like Trinity Sunday because while God is foreign to us and it's difficult for us to understand, he wants to have a relationship for us. And in order to have a relationship, you have to have some understanding of the other party. And so we seek to know God and we come up with the best words we can and we come up with these terrible analogies of four-leaf clovers and fidget spinners and whatever else you can think of to describe him. The reality is that we will never fully know him as he is in himself but he's revealed himself to us in part. And so when we read readings like we, we read today, you get all this fantastic language with colorful pictures of creatures with multiple heads and eyes and wings and limbs, and it's all, it's, it's all so fanciful and fantastic as these men try to come up with words to describe what God has shown them. A story I often share, because I just... I love it so much, is in Exodus. God has been leading Moses, and they've been talking back and forth for a while now, and Moses says, God, I want to see you. Show me your face. 
And God says, I can't. If I show my face to you, it'll kill you. But I tell you what I'll do. You go in the cleft of the rock and I'll put my hand over you and I'll show you my back. And so he gets just a little glimpse of God's glory through a little slit and it makes his face shine so radiant that it's terrifying to the people when he gets back to the camp and he has to cover his face. And that's what we do when we when we study God's word, when we seek to get to know him, we, we get just little glimpses of God. We study the Trinity. We're trying to get a sense of who he is. We get this small, tiny picture. But again, tying back to Pentecost last week, we don't do this on our own. As our gospel lesson tells us this morning, God sends his spirit to do this work with us. Echoing what God said to Moses, he says, you can't bear it all. You can't bear the whole truth now, but the spirit of God will come to you and reveal these things to you in due time. He'll be your guide and he will glorify Jesus and he will tell you all of the things of God and declare them to you. Like the child at eight and then 18 and 30 and 60, you get more and more of a sense of who he is. On our, we, get, we get more and more of a sense of who he is on our, on our faith journey. I've said a lot, and this has probably gone on too long, but my challenge for us today is that we would, we would hold on to that. And we would do our best not to get so wrapped up in all of the paradoxes, trying to understand who God is. And remember that ultimately he's not totally comprehensible, but we can bask in the truth and in the glory of himself that he's revealed to, to us in his word and through his spirit. Amen.